What I love about what you're teaching us is I think that we've gotten to this point, <clears throat> especially when you look at content on social media, where there's so much of a push to cut people out of your life, to label that sort of stonewalling is the word that you just use. But you know, if you think about it from the standpoint of somebody that has trauma in their past, or they have just an avoidant attachment style because of what they experienced as a child, and that it's just overwhelming to feel those emotions. Like if you can come at it from a sense of compassion, like I'm, I, 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 I love what you're teaching us because through understanding, you might be able to keep somebody in your life instead of just being like, that's it, you're out, you don't talk, you don't go deep, you're stonewalling me, you're ghosting me, when really there's, a, there's a, another side to this coin which is, no, this is a person who, through their childhood, gets very overwhelmed by mm -hmm. these emotions and by intimacy, and they protect themselves by removing. This isn't about hurting you. It's about them protecting themselves. Am I kind mm -hmm. of processing this the right way, Dr. Franco? You are, certainly, certainly. Um, and, you know, I think if you want to be in a relationship with someone who's avoidant, it's important that you try to get your needs met in another relationship, right? Like not trying to depend on this one avoidant person to meet all of your needs. The more that your needs are met elsewhere, the more you can be flexible with the person that's more avoidant, right? Huh. So the more that I feel like in another relationship makes me feel secure, another relationship, I can be really vulnerable and deep, another relationship, I feel um, really loved and valued, right? Then you kind of have your cup full enough to be able to be more flexible with that avoidantly attached person who's like, you know, we had some intimacy, now I need a breather and I need to kind of pull away for a while. Um, but I, I do think that we should challenge avoidantly attached people to say that it's okay that you need boundaries around intimacy and it's okay that intimacy scares you, but you also need to fill people in. Like you have to just say, be able to say like, Hey, I'm a little overwhelmed right now. Like I need like about a week and then I'll, I'll come back and we can talk about this. Right. Instead of not communicating anything and just sort of, um, of ghosting on people. Cause that, that hurts people a lot. So, so, you know, I think on both Does it ends, hurt the person who's avoidant when they ghost? Is that contribute to them? shame or is that just a way to just kind of you know, because you know, I, you, we, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So what, what we see the pattern being like is anxiously attached people think too much about other people and not enough about themselves and avoidantly attached people think a lot about themselves and their own needs and not as much about their impact on other people. So, um, you know, the anxious person being willing to completely sacrifice their sense of self and do whatever their partner needs, and they're not actually happy they still feel like they're in a relationship with another person, which is not actually the goal, right? The goal isn't to be in a relationship at all costs. It's to like be in a relationship that elevates you and helps you express who you are and, you know, makes you feel happier. Um, but the avoidantly attached person, they're very, it's like when you, you're negotiating with someone and they have all the resources and all the power, mm. like it just tends to be the anxiously attached person who's adjusting to the avoidantly attached person because the avoidantly attached person is like, well, I'm okay alone. I'm okay independent. I don't really need these relationships with other people, but you will find that avoidantly attached people, they tend to have like a phantom ex where while they're in a relationship, they don't appreciate it. But then when it's over, they look back on it. Once they're like avoidant, they call these like deactivating strategies, which is like basically at some point, this avoidant side of them really takes over and all they can think about is needing space and feeling suffocated and needing boundaries. It's like kind of like crisis mode. But once they have that space, that deactivating side moves away and they tend to look back on these relationships and miss them and feel lonely and realize that they do also really need connection. So it's the avoidantly attached person is kind of in this very stuck place where it's like one side of me really needs connection and another side of me is so afraid of it, afraid mm. of it, because I think if you get too close, you're going to harm me. That is what the avoidantly attached person sees. I think if you get too close, you're not actually going to like who I am. You're going to see me as less than and deficient and a failure. Right. So, so there's, they can't 
decouple intimacy for its beauty and its feelings of connection and meaning from intimacy as a threat, as a sign of betrayal, as a sign of being judged, as a sign of being ultimately rejected. So um, once, you know, once that side of threat, once that piece of threat takes the piece of threat takes over and they ghost and they might actually feel relieved from being separated from the relationship at first. But then as that deactivating part sort of melts away a little bit, they're, they start to grieve. They'll have a more sort of delayed grief process around the relationship. Hmm. Can you have uh, more than one attachment style? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, like I said, in each different relationship, you can have a different attachment style and that is, it makes sense, right? Because if someone is very anxious and is like, I need all your time and attention and you need to be showing me that you love me all the time, right? You're going to be like, I need some space. I need some me time. I'm losing myself to try to, you know, reassure you in all these ways. And if someone's super avoidant and they're very distant and you're like trying to connect with them and they're always pulling away, you're going to feel pretty anxious, right? Where it's like, oh my gosh, like I feel insecure. Do they actually like me? Um, so, so it is a dynamic and in different relationships, we can see different parts of our attachment style coming out. Uh, there's also a really fascinating theory called internal family systems theory, which is this idea that we have, we all have multiple selves within us, like our sixth grade self um, that was bullied is still within us. And, you know, our, our ch inner child self that was like five years old and going through what we did in our family life is still within us. And at different moments, each of these selves can kind of come out and take over. And, you know, if you follow that framework, like each of yourselves can have a different attachment style, but the goal of internal family systems is to be led by your highest self at any given time. Um, your highest self is like your most adult self that is most centered and stable and loving and compassionate. And that self, that highest self within us is all, within all of us is secure. Like I do believe all of us have a piece of us that is securely attached. The more we can access that self, the more we'll feel secure in our relationships. Well, that sounds like good news. So <laughs> it sounds like uh, within each one of us is a person or a self that is capable of secure attachment. So are you saying that if you can start to identify your default attachment style and see it as a lens and an opportunity for growth and improvement, that it is possible to change your default attachment style and become more secure? Yes. So like, I guess it's called like internalized secure attachment where you have to start treating and talking to yourself like that secure attachment figure that you maybe didn't have. So, um, you know, when you're feeling a strong emotion, being able to tell yourself, it's okay that you feel this way. Like I'm right here with you. Um, and you know, what are you feeling and what do you need right now? Like almost being on your own side and being really, really loving toward yourself is like, that's part of the ways that we heal. Part of the ways that we find secure attachment is like, we think about like, I'll even, this is like different things I've done to, to find more security is like singing love songs to yourself. Um, and, you know, when you're activated and triggered, realizing that that's not all of you and that there's a piece of you that is still grounded. And what does that grounded part of you want to say to the triggered part of you? What love does it have to give in this moment? It also takes like, What's happening with the insecure attachment styles is they're reactive. They're um, getting really emotionally overwhelmed and they're acting based on that sense of emotional overwhelm, right? So the anxiously attached person is like clinging, 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 right? And, and it's almost like reflexive. They're not acting with intention anymore. They feel like they're almost kind of hijacked. And the avoidantly mm -hmm. per attached person is also very hijacked, but instead it's to pull away, pull away, pull away, right? But if we can just like pause and like, feel those uncomfortable emotions like oh my gosh i feel i feel so rejected right now i feel so abandoned right now like where do you feel that emotion in your body how can you lean into feeling it more deeply allow yourself to feel it right because fundamentally this acting out behavior is a way to try to cope with a very difficult underlying emotion 
And you can, instead of using this acting out behavior, like the anxiously attached person demanding things of the other person or clinging to the other person or the avoidantly attached person suddenly pulling away, you can develop your own tolerance for that feeling or emotion that's very uncomfortable so that you don't have to act out in your relationships to protect yourself from it. I want to focus on avoidant or disorganized right now because I really identify personally with anxious attachment. And since you already said that somebody with an anxious, anxious attachment style is kind of prone to self-diagnose and want to fix it and always be thinking it, I'm thinking about avoidant now. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking about disorganized because as you go sing a love song to yourself, I personally am like, oh, that sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Franco, can we talk to the person who's listening right now who just had a visceral, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> no, I'm serious because yeah. I, I, I think that for people who are already like, yeah, I, I'm sick of being hijacked by my emotions. I am married to somebody who is avoidant. I realized in researching this show, Dr. Franco, and getting ready for this interview I didn't understand attachment style, and yet I have been talking about it in couples therapy for two years because I'm anxious and my husband is avoidant. And the shame piece that he feels and puts onto himself is something I was unaware of. Like I've been griping that, oh, you know, I'm married to this guy. It's really quiet and he doesn't spread. And trying to draw him out. Yeah. And so could you first explain to somebody who's having a, this is not, ugh, I'm, I'm not going to tell myself, why the hell would you do that? Could you explain why it is so important for happiness and confidence and success, these things that we all deserve to learn how to change and grow toward a more secure attachment, particularly for somebody who's avoidant or disorganized? Mm. Yeah, here's the thing about avoidantly attached people. They think they're super independent and don't really need anyone, but that's a defense mechanism against an underlying need for connection that they don't think they can actually fulfill. And I think if you're being really honest with yourself, no matter what your attachment style is, you'll see that you a part of you really does crave connection. And if you felt like you could find it and feel comfortable and safe with it, that would, it would feel a lot safer for you to admit it to yourself. And I'll also say that you will not know how beautiful connection, deep, profound, sustaining connection is until you find it. Um, that's the only way that you'll be able to judge whether you need connection in your life or not, right? Because you're thinking you don't need connection, but fundamentally, you don't even know what connection is because avoidantly attached people, when they're in relationships, they're not actually vulnerable. They're not sharing anything about themselves. They're not very like authentic to be real. And so that is, they're connecting in a very shallow way. And they're saying, when they're saying, I don't need connection, it's like, I don't need that, <laughs> which is, you know, arguably, um, not true and deep connection, right? Because it's not revealing and, and you're not actually being known by other people and they're not knowing you and you're not, you know, there's not this giving and receiving of love that's happening. It's kind of just like we're two people that are, you know, in each other's presence, right? And so, you know, I think there's this, um, and what I'm saying is that there's this disjuncture between what the avoidant person doesn't think that they need and what connection actually is and what connection actually can be and how connection can make you feel alive and seen and centered and grounded and supported and lighter, right? Like those are all the things that true connection will give you that you will miss out on if you're very avoidant. You are going to finally get some answers to questions that I am sure have been on your mind for a long time. Questions like, why do I always feel left out in my friend group? Why do I always date the same losers over and over and over again? 